Well, good evening to one and all. We're going to read the words of a hymn, 207. It's a very beautiful hymn. My song is love unknown, my Saviour's love to me. Love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? He came from his blessed throne, salvation to bestow. But men made strange, and none the long for Christ would know. But, oh, my friend, my friend indeed, who at my need his life did spend. Sometimes they strew his way, and his sweet praises sing, resounding all the day, hosannas to their king, then crucify is all their breath, and for his death they thirst and cry. Why, what has my Lord done? What makes this rage and spite? He made the lame to run, he gave the blind their sight. Sweet injuries, yet they at these themselves displease and against him rise. They rise and needs will have my dear Lord made a way. A murderer they saved, the prince of life they slay. Yet cheerful he to suffering goes, that he his foes from thence might free. In life, no house, no home, my Lord on earth might have. In death, no friendly tomb, but what a stranger gave. What may I say, heaven was his home, but mine the tomb wherein he lay. Here might I stay and sing, no story so divine, never was love, dear king, never was grief like thine. This is my friend, in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. And we thank God for the reminder of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, we're glad to gather in your holy presence. We're glad to call upon your name. We're glad to be reminded of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and gave his life on our behalf. And to be reminded, O oh God, of all the suffering and the shame and the hurt and pain that he bore, to know and to be able to call him our friend and to speak of one who is a friend who sticks closer even than a brother. Help us, we pray, day by day to remember the Saviour and to look to him. As we gather this evening, we pray, Heavenly Father, that our worship would be in spirit and truth. We pray that we might know delight in waiting upon God. And our prayer we offer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to read God's word as we find it in the book of Acts this evening, in Acts and in chapter 2. It's quite a long reading, but we'll, we'll read the lot. So from Acts in chapter 2, verse 1, and all the way through then to verse 47. The book of Acts, chapter 2, at verse 1 and down to 47. And we'll switch that off before we go any further. That's good. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came um, a sound from heaven as a, of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the holy spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance and there were dwelling in jerusalem jews devout men from every nation under heaven and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in his own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. 
So they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, They are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have not made known, sorry, you have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved. From this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his words were baptized, and that day about three thousand souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And we thank God for the reading of his word. We'll come back to that very shortly. 
We're going to turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our loving Father in heaven, we thank you that we can return to gather in your holy presence and to call upon your name. And we thank you that we have this wonderful privilege that we've been beckoned into the very holy presence of God and told that when we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. We very much stand in need, O oh God, that you would draw near to us. And we pray that as we gather then in your holy presence in this very simple way, that you, Lord, would come in all your might and power, in all your grace and love, in all your tender dealings, in all your patience and your long, long suffering, and that you would reach out to us. We need you, and we need your grace, O oh God, every day, but we, we sense that we're in a new week. We sense, Heavenly Father, that um, some will be back to the fullness of work this week. They'll be very busy. Some, Heavenly Father, will be um, schooling in some way or other. We, we don't even guess to know which way all of this is going. But we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would remember one and all in their different and individual needs and that you would grant us, O oh God, that we may know your blessing and your hand and your love and your kindness to be upon our lives. We need you. We know that the air that we breathe, we know that the food that we eat, the water that we drink, the warmth that we have in our homes, and all that comes our way is only of your kindness and only of your love. We know, Heavenly Father, that were it to be that you were to take the warmth of the sunshine away for but a few hours, we would quickly freeze to death. And were it to be, Heavenly Father, that we were to know unlimited sunshine and without the atmosphere above to care for us that we very quickly would fry alive. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you set us in this place and you've given us life and being and existence and all the good things around us are sent from heaven above. And so we want to be thankful, we want to be grateful at the beginning of a new year. We want to count our many blessings. We want to name them one by one and with the assurance that it will surprise us what the Lord has done. We do pray, Lord, that you would remember those with particular and special needs and those who look after loved ones and they're worried about them, they're concerned for them. We pray, Lord, whatever those needs are, and there are health issues there, we're conscious of that tonight. We pray that you would bless and remember and deal with them with loving kindness and tender mercy. We pray, Heavenly Father, that in these days, you would help us to be conscious, O oh God, that we uh, live in, in difficulties, in trial, as individuals, but as a, as a nation. And oh, that as a nation, we may return to God. And Heavenly Father, what blessing this land has known in years afore. How many times that you have reached out in revival, how you've blessed this land in terms of the Reformation and in the deposit of your word that she so enjoyed for, for so long. And what um, wonderful foundations were laid in terms of listening to and following your law as a nation. And yet, where are we now? And we wander away from God and our, our leaders would have us wander further. And what a, a miserable state, O oh God, we're in. And how can we wonder then that we find ourselves under the wrath and judgment of God? Be merciful to us, Lord, we pray in these difficult days. We do want especially to pray tonight for those who have the rule over us. And we do pray, Lord, that you would make them truly wise. We keep praying for them to be wise. And we, we want them to be wise, Lord. But at our, our heart's depth, we want them to be truly wise and to realize there's a God in heaven before whom one day they'll give an account of all their responsibilities, of all their decisions. Oh Lord, we pray that you might make them conscious that they're answerable to, to God Almighty. We pray for those who uh, we're told are struggling with a great struggle in the health service at this time. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would remember them. We pray uh, for those who are weary and tired and worn out and we pray, oh God, that you would help them. And we realize that if what we're being told is correct, there are more difficult days to come. Oh Lord, all we can do is to pray 
to you and to ask you to be gracious and to be kind and to be merciful. And we do pray, Heavenly Father, that as a community we might be wise and that we might uh, keep safely from one another and that we might not cause more difficulties. Lord, we commit all of these things into your hand. That's all we can do. And we commend ourselves to your keeping care. So remember us, we pray. Remember us in the week that is to come, prayer meeting there on Tuesday night. May it be, O God, that we'll know a, a renewed determination to call upon the name of the Lord. And help us, we pray, as we simply do that week after week after week. May it be that you'll hear our prayers in a wonderful way and grant wonderful answers to our simple prayers. We pray, Lord, that you'd remember too um, for uh, juniors this week and we commend them to you and as they begin again, uh, we pray that the young people would know joy in meeting with one another across the internet. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that despite the limitations and the frustrations that this brings, that, Lord, we be able to make the most of that opportunity. And we pray for your word especially, that it may have an impact upon lives. Lord, remember in these days we pray unto the ends of the earth with the gospel that is being um, sent out in, in so many ways now. We could never have imagined it would happen like this. And yet, uh, Heavenly Father, wonderfully, the, the gospel going forth in so many different ways, so many people with an opportunity that perhaps otherwise they might not have had. It's extraordinary. But we pray our prayers to you. We ask forgiveness for our sins. We ask your blessing upon your word. We pray that as we come around the communion table, that you would come and meet with us there. And our prayers we offer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, the announcements are fairly simple. We're here this evening for church. Um, it's the Lord's Supper, and you're invited to remain. If you know and are walking in fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ, you're very welcome to remain with us there this evening. We trust, if that's the case, that you will. We'll um, meet on, uh, well, we'll meet in the prayer meeting on Tuesday evening upstairs um, in the Blue Room at 8 o'clock. Um, if you can be with us there, or if you want to meet with us on Skype, that would be good. Or if you just simply want to use the telephone, we can do all of those things. Um, and they're all possibles, so do please make the most of that opportunity and seek to meet with God as we seek to meet with God here. Friday brings the young people together again in uh, juniors, and we look forward to that. Um, they had a good uh, run there in the autumn, and we trust they'll know a good run now in the spring. And we pray God's blessing upon all these things. Seniors will be back next week, God willing, and so will children's meeting, but we leave these things with God. Um, next Lord's Day, Sunday morning in the hall, Sunday evening here in church, and we trust that those are all the announcements. We're going to read a psalm. I've got a somewhere here. Psalm 138. I'm going to read this evening. Psalm 138. And these words, if I can get there. I'll praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I'll sing your praise. I'll bow toward your holy place and bless your holy name always. I'll praise you for your faithfulness and for your covenant love, O Lord. For over all things you have raised your holy name and faithful word. The very day I called to you, you gave an answer to my plea. You made me bold within myself. With new resolve, you strengthened me. O Lord, let all earth's kings give you praise when from your mouth they hear your word. Let them extol the ways of God, for great's the glory of the Lord. Although the Lord, the Lord God dwells on high, the lowly person he protects, whereas the proud and haughty one he knows afar off and rejects. Although I walk a troubled path, your tender care preserves my life. You raise your hand against my foes, your right hand saves me from their strife. The Lord will certainly fulfill for me the purpose he commands. Your love endures forever, Lord. Preserve the works of your own hands. It's a beautiful psalm and that confidence that God cares for his children and will look after them in all of life's many, many situations. 
Well, um, I want to turn this evening into the book of Acts and into Acts and chapter 2 as we've read it there this evening. It's a wonderful story, of course, of what happened on the day of Pentecost and we read that in those um, first 39, 40 verses. And then following that, we um, read of what happened in the New Testament church. We read, of course, that there were um, some 3,000 people who got converted that day And we read that the church is obviously gaining. People are being added to the church um, that day, verse 41, and in succeeding days, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Wonderful day. It's a day when we would all have liked to have been there, I imagine, in the church. What a wonderfully encouraging day that would have been. And no doubt all of God's people would like to have been there on such a day. I want to turn to verse 42. And in verse 42, we have a description of the New Testament church, where we read, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. I don't know whether you're into pictures. We are, as a family, into pictures and have been for a long, long time. Pictures bring back wonderful memories. Um, Sometimes they bring back um, great laughter and joy, and there are funny happenings, things that you've forgotten, and then the pictures come out, and we sit and look at the pictures, and someone will uh, remember something that happened, and it will bring much laughter and much joy, and uh, they have the capacity to make you grateful. They have the capacity to make you glad of course there are sad pictures too Um, sometimes we do struggle to remember the occasion the location sometimes you struggle to remember the people who are in the picture that's the way it goes isn't it sometimes with pictures well um, in acts and chapter 2 and verse 42 we've got a picture in some ways it's not so much a picture but a snap shot it's not posed that's what i mean that's the difference i'm drawing there Um, you know you can take your snapshots or there may be something that's rather more posed or you've worked on it afterwards and it's been enhanced. But this picture is not enhanced. Um, there's no darkroom work being done on the picture. There's no um, sort of electronic uh, jiggery pokery being done on the picture to enhance it in any sense. Um, it's not been enhanced. It's not been digitally doctored, anything like that. It's simply a straightforward, if you like, a snapshot. And it's a snapshot of what the church, the early church, looked like. It's a snapshot of what early church life looked like. And for that reason, it's a very important snapshot, very important little picture for us. And it tells us what the church in Jerusalem looked like. There are, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure you, you've probably seen some of those older pictures of Ballyclare. Some people have the little books, don't they? You get these little books with all oldie worldy pictures of Ballyclare. And lovely to look at and lovely to try and work out where's where and, and so on. There's some lovely aerial pictures you can get. And they're, they're very interesting pictures to, to look at and how the, 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 the town has changed. And I think I mentioned this a few months ago, but there's one of those aerial pictures. And you can see the old church to the right there. Um, the wooden construction and so on and lovely to see these old pictures look at old pictures of Bally Clare and they might look very different one of the things you always notice is that the roads are not really made up roads you know they look a bit rough and and so on some of the um, modes of transport that are traveling on them are rather different as well Um, I wrote this I'm not sure this week what day I wrote this for. It's been a very strange week, but I wrote this whichever day it was, and then I, I came for a walk down to, to, to Asda later on in the day, and having written that, there was the horse and cart. You've seen the horse and cart. It goes around Bally Clay. You see it quite often. And there it was, that, that, that self-same day, the reminder that there are still horse and cart in Bally Clay. But, you know, you look at these pictures, and it may look very different. The dress may look very different. The hairstyles may look very different. They all belong to a different era. And that would be the case too, if that's what we were looking at in Jerusalem. But when we think of the picture that we've got here of the New Testament church, it's the picture that we should be looking at in Ballyclare. The picture that we look at in Jerusalem 
ought to be identical to the picture that we look at in Ballyclare. Because we're not interested in what they wear. We're not interested in their hairstyles. We're not interested in how they got there or how they went home. We're not interested in the building that they met in. But we are interested in what they did. And that's the focus of the picture. The picture is not focusing on those side issues that really are a complete irrelevance. The picture is focusing on what they did. If you like, what they were. But what they did, I suppose. Here's a picture of the early church. And they tell us what today's church should look like. And so, you know, there's a difference between those old pictures of Ballyclare and today, but there should be no difference at all between the picture that we've got in Acts 2 and verse 42 and the picture that we take today. They should be identical, shouldn't they? We're going to look at this little picture then this evening, and I'm simply going to pick up this evening on, on the first um, little thing that's mentioned there, and over the next few weeks we'll look at all the different elements of the picture but I want to speak this evening about the Apostles' Doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. That's what I want to think about this evening. Think about the detail. Think about the doctrine. Think about the desire. Those are the three little headings we've got tonight. Think about the detail. Think about the doctrine. Think about the desire. First of all, think about the detail. Now what we've got here in Acts 2 and verse 42 is of considerable importance. It was important in its day and it's important for us now. And it's of considerable importance to the church of Jesus Christ. Someone might die and you might have a hand in sorting out their affairs. That's not an easy business, sorting out someone's affairs. And it's not easy then when it comes to the sort of trinkets of life, you know what I mean? And so there are things then that are obviously very, very special to the person who is deceased. But sometimes it's not easy to see why they were so special. Sometimes there are pictures when someone dies and they can be of a complete irrelevance to you and you don't know who's in the picture and you don't know why the picture was so important or precious. And people didn't always write, did they? You know, and, and make an album of it and so on. They're just a collection of old photographs. And they meant something to the person who has died, but they maybe don't mean much to you or I. This is an important series of pictures. A very important series of pictures. And it's important to us as individuals, and it's important to the church. Because it tells us of what the Christian, of what the Christian church is to look like. It tells us of what a valid profession of Christianity is to look like. You see, we could all get excited about, you know, being there um, on the day of Pentecost, couldn't we, you know? We'd all be up for that. I don't think anybody would be, you know, out of that one. If we were able to sort of, I don't suggest this is real life, but if we were able to do a sort of Doctor Who, I'm not into Doctor Who, but if we were able to sort of do a Doctor Who and to be there on the day of Pentecost, we'd probably all be up for that. And we'd, you know, we'd be able to sort of be there on this fantastic day when these 3,000 are saved and there are these dramatic happenings. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Because Luke immediately goes on and he lets us see what real professions of faith, what it produces in terms of church life what a valid profession of christianity should look like because i watched um part of it was the latter part but part of dunkirk the other night we'd seen the film um some i'm not sure how many years that has been out but we actually saw that in the cinema it's a, it's a good film if you've not seen it's worth watching it's quite a moving story of course a lot of history um mrs hoey remember mrs hoey mrs hoey loved the story of dunkirk and um, if you ever suggested to Mrs. Hoy that Dunkirk was a failure, you were in serious trouble. Because she did not construe it as a failure. She saw it as a great success. 
But anyway, we watched the film um, part of it at least the other night. And part of it, of course, in, in war is recognizing who is the enemy. And here are these folk and um, they're in dire straits wanting to get back across the channel. And here are these aircraft coming in. And are they friendly aircraft there to protect them or are they enemy aircraft to destroy them? And sometimes it's hard to recognize. Here are pictures. And they're important pictures. And it's important that we look through Luke's lens and see what the early church looked like. Think about the man behind the lens about Luke. Dr. Luke, as sometimes he's called, Luke was into his detail. He was a detailed man. We first meet Luke, um, not until Acts in chapter 16 and verse 10. He doesn't say much about himself. He's the man who writes the book, but he doesn't say much about himself. He, he doesn't sort of, you know, want to um, write his name in lights or anything like that. He's not looking for name and fame. He's not looking to, to leave, a, you know, some sort of a a testimony, you know, testimonial behind. He's not trying to do anything like that. We read of him in um, Acts 16, verse 10, as I say, now after he had seen the vision immediately, we sought, and that's how Luke gets in. It goes from what they were doing to what we were doing. And that's, that's all it is with Luke. He doesn't try and write his name in lights. He's a man that we can really trust. We saw him in Luke's gospel um, there for a number of years, fairly recently. And he's the man, of course, who comes, he's written Luke, and then he comes and he writes in Acts. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. And he's referring to Luke's gospel, and he says, well, now I want to tell you the rest of the story. And so he tells us what Jesus did in the first part of the story, and what Jesus did in the second part of the story. When he was upon earth, and when he was away from this earth, and in glory. And you remember that he's concerned for the detail. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. And he's writing this very detailed account in Luke, and he continues it then in Acts. And he's taken this snapshot. But it's an important snapshot. He becomes part of the apostolic workforce, but he's not an apostle. But he's evidently a very reliable and great worker. And if there were, you know, people who let Paul down. So John Mark is someone who let Paul down, but wonderfully at the end of the story he's restored to favor and so on um, if Demas is someone who let Paul down and so on this man Luke is he didn't let Paul down only Luke is with me we read in the scripture Luke was there when others had let Paul down and he's described as a faithful worker he was someone that Paul could rely upon Someone that Paul could trust. He's found only in a positive way in the scriptures. And oh, to be, you know, to be a positive person, isn't it? Oh, to be a steady worker. Oh, to be a rock. You don't want the name and fame of being a rock, but you do want, you know, the function of being a rock. Luke was a rock. I would use the word brick, to be honest. That's the word I would use. If you describe somebody as a brick, that's somebody that you can rely upon. That's somebody that you can depend upon. If you say of someone they're a brick, that doesn't sound like much of a commendation, but it's a commendation in my book. That's someone that you can rely upon. And Luke was a brick. And Luke was very methodical. He was very strict. He was very concerned to get the story straight. And in a way, Acts 2 and verse 42 is a snapshot in that they didn't pose for it. You know? They didn't put their best clothes on. They didn't get their hair done. Can you see what I'm saying? It wasn't a photograph in the sense that they all sat in the right place and took 10 minutes to arrange it and took 15 photographs to make sure that everybody's eyes were looking in the right direction. 
We have that problem in our family now. But you know what it's like trying to get everybody's eyes looking in a decent direction? That doesn't always work out so easily. But this was not a posed photograph. This was a snapshot. And yet at the same time, it's a picture. And Luke is there. Of course, he wasn't there in Acts 2 and verse 42. But Luke is there with the apostles. And he knows the story. And he knows what the early church looked like. And he's telling us what today's church should look like. And one of the things about the early church and one of the things that is to be setting apart today's church is its concern for the apostles' doctrine. Some people have said there is a tradition that says that Luke was an artist as well. He was a doctor, but apparently it's said I've never seen any proof of that, but people do say that, that Luke was also an artist. I don't know. But if he was, he's painting a picture of the early church, of what early Christians looked like and how we should recognize them. So there we are at Dunkirk. And here's this plane coming towards us. But we can immediately tell from its shape, we hope, well, we should be able to tell from the shape of a Christian's life that he is indeed a child of God. It should tell us so much immediately. We shouldn't need to see the little circles on the side. We should be able to tell just looking at his life what this person is about. Think about the detail. Think about the doctrine. Think about the doctrine. Because we've got an important picture here of the early church, but what is the first thing that we see? And we've often said that, haven't we? You know, what's, what's the first thing that you see? We've often pointed up firsts. So, you know, the early first chapters of the, the book of Genesis are so crucially important. The first psalm is so important. What's the first thing that we see here? It's the apostles' doctrine. Notice the word doctrine. The English translation of that word immediately perhaps frightens us and perhaps we think immediately of something that's heavy. But the idea behind the word is not nearly so heavy. It's the word teaching. And what we're being told here is that the early church was into teaching. They were into God's Word. What marked out the early church? What was so clearly the thing that told you that this was the church? Well, says Luke, they were into the apostles' doctrine. They were into the teaching of God's word. It used to be a concern in uh, days gone by. I'm not sure that it's the same concern in the day and age in which we find ourselves but it used to be the concern. Someone's looking for a church. What's the teaching like? That was the concern. That was the concern. What's the teaching like? That's what people wanted to know. It's not just like that anymore, is it? Which says everything. That tells you everything, really. But that used to be the concern that people would have voiced. Looking for the church, what are you looking for? What's the teaching like? That was uppermost in people's mindset. But I'm far from being persuaded that that's where many people are now. They've moved away from that. But the concern of the early church, Luke tells us, was with the teaching. The teaching. The word, the word doctrine there, is a word that simply means to teach. But it might be useful and helpful um, to us there this evening very quickly to look through some of the uses of this word in the New Testament, just so that it drives home to us how important it is. And so here we are, we mentioned this morning the start of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew in chapter 5, but here we are at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 and verse 28, and we read, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. What did Jesus do? He taught 
people. If you like, he doctrined people, but he taught people, didn't he? He taught them. That's what he did. He taught them from God's word. He brought the power of God's word to bear upon their lives. We are in Luke itself, chapter 4, verse 32, where we read that he was teaching them on the Sabbath, verse 31, verse 32, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. This was doctrine. This was teaching. It was of great importance. It was of great significance. It mattered a great deal. What did the Lord Jesus do? He taught people from God's word. The teaching was of great importance. Here we are in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 17. But though, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. They took seriously what God said. They listened to it. It was a matter of importance to them. Chapter 16, verse 17. Now, I urge you, brethren, note those who call div cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned. The doctrine is of great importance as far as Paul is concerned. It's important as far as the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned. Here's the, the letters to the seven churches. And in those letters to the seven churches, you get the same word being used. Here we are in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have those there who hold the doctrine of Balaam. And it seems that um, in the church in Pergamos, they were putting up with false teaching and the Lord Jesus Christ is not amused. You say, well, it doesn't matter. As long as we get the music right. You know, as long as we get the coffee right. As long as we get the appearance of the building right. It doesn't matter. Well, it mattered to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't see him writing about the music and nor do I see him writing about the coffee. It mattered to the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't it? It mattered to the early church. And it should matter to us. Sometimes people say of doctrine, well, it's heavy going. It's heavy going. Well, it was the teaching of God's word. Yes, in a sense, it probably was. Is Romans chapter 1 to 11, is that heavy going? We looked at it years ago. Is Romans 1 to 11 heavy going? Yep, feral whack to Romans 1 to 11. Is it God's word? Is it part of the teaching? Is it what God says? Is it the doctrine? Yes, it is, isn't it? Yes, it is. Now, I fully recognize that there can be a a kind of preaching, but I wouldn't even call it preaching because it's more like lecturing. But there can be a kind of preaching. I'm not happy with the word being used in that context that is, you know, completely unrelated to our circumstance. That's got nothing really to do with our need. That's no good. We need a balanced diet, don't we? Sometimes we don't know what our need is, but we need a balanced diet. Notice it's the apostles' doctrine. It wasn't a case of whatever you want. You remember in the days of the judges that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Remember that? Every man did as they saw fit. God brought them back repeatedly through judge after judge after judge. But that was characteristic of the day and age. But it wasn't characteristic of this early church age because wonderfully they're listening to the apostles' doctrine. You say, well, who were these apostles? Why should they be listening to the apostles' doctrine? Well, because they were the men that Christ had appointed to the task. That's why. 
because they were the men that Christ had chosen. They were witnesses of his life and of his resurrection because they were the men that Christ has appointed, because they were the men that Jesus spoke to in this way when he said, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance, all things that I said to you. This was a very special group of men. Luke wasn't part of them. He was there helping, but he wasn't part of them. This is a very special group of men. This is the same group of men that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to when he said in chapter 15 of Luke, when he said there at verse 26, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. This was a very special group of men, a unique group of men. They were never replaced. They never put up an advert, you know. There was no, no advert running in the Jerusalem Times, you know, for a, a replacement apostle.
is real. That's truth. That's that's the truth. Word. 
that's the book of Lamentation. 